Hi, Mary Richards. Hi, Lizzie Lasseter. Welcome to another episode of today's anatomy question. Today we're going to talk about some terminology, some key fundamental terms. So what I'd like you to share with us, if you can narrow it down, what would be three fundamental anatomy terms that yoga, both for sort of yoga teachers and yoga practitioners, what do we need to understand in your expert opinion as an anatomist? Okay. Uh, what I really appreciate most about this question, first of all, is that it's about building a common language. Mm -hmm. And so we can use anatomical terms to improve our communication. Okay. Because I think there's this book out there called What We Say Matters. <laughs> <laughs> and it talks about, you know, the importance of communication. And so, especially for those of us that lead classes in asana, mm -hmm. we, we really want to have this common vocabulary of the body. So, three terms. This was so hard for, this is hard for me. <laughs> uh, the first I would say is gravity. Okay. Okay. So, um, even though physics is evolving, mm -hmm. uh, there are still, there's still large agreement that Lu Newton's law of universal gravitation still provides an accurate description of gravity, right. which is basically that two bodies of mass are attracted to each other. So and that's exactly what's occurring with our body and the earth. We are in a constant relationship. The body, our body, is in constant relationship with the body of the earth mm -hmm. all the time. We live in a state of yoga. And your mom uses a term uh, that gravity is the conductor of the orchestra. Okay. I haven't that. I like that. I do too, because I really like to think of it that way, because with asana, we're always changing our relationship with between the body and the earth. Right. And gravity has a profound effect on that relationship, on, on its mediation, if you will. And it determines how your muscles act. So we can break down gravity into three primary categories. Okay. See, I'm going to get extra words in, Lizzie. <laughs> because, I, because I told you, please only give us three terms. It's, we're getting overloaded. And then you come at me with your list of 10 terms, and then they have subcategories. So, so gravity, uh, but what I, what I want to hear the subterms, I'm teasing. But what right. I want to know also is if you can, I'm putting you on the spot, but if you can think of a specific example of where often yoga students in asana like sort of are disregarding gravity. Oh, when they are upside down. Mm -hmm. In particular, shirsasana, headstand, and shoulder stand, or even in a standing forward fold. Okay, let's take that as an example. So you're in Uttanasana, and what are uh -huh. people misunderstanding about what gravity is doing to their bodies in that moment? Uh, they tend to think that it's a break for the, for the muscles of the front body. Oh, okay. Thank goodness we're not doing warrior two. I can let my quadriceps relax. Right. No. <laughs> you need to use the muscles of the front body to help stabilize. Okay, now I'm, I've am i got to be really careful because now I'm starting to think about other actions. So when we're in forward fold, for instance, we are moving with gravity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's called gravity assisted. Okay. movement. And the tendency, especially in vinyasa classes, is to go with the flow. Right. But what we really need when we're moving, remember gravity is always moving down toward the earth. Right. What we really need to remember is that we've got to put the brakes on. Uh-huh. To protect our joints, we need to put the brakes on. That's how we mediate moving with gravity is by slowing down. I understand. Okay, so what are the okay. three subtypes for gravity you were talking about? Okay, so gravity assisted, mm -hmm. when you're moving in the direction of gravity. Okay. 
And then there's against gravity. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly important with shoulder flexion, right. with shoulder movements, because we tend to move our arms against gravity. Right. So when you're, uh, when you're bringing your, when you're doing something as simple as uh, bringing your arms up and overhead, that's a movement against gravity within right. the shoulder. Okay. And then we have gravity eliminated positions. So if you think about uh, Shavasana, mm -hmm. or if you think about plank pose. Okay. So in a gravity eliminated position, your energy is moving perpendicular to gravity. To gravity. Right. Gravity is always moving down. But if we're in plank pose, mm -hmm. we're crossing gravity. Mm -hmm. And so our static strength, our ability to hold position is really important. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I'm laughing at myself because push-ups are a great example. <laughs> we know how I feel about push-ups. Push-ups push use uh, all three of these subcategories of gravity. Okay. When you're in the push-up phase, when you're down mm -hmm. like this, well, you're working against gravity. You've right. got to push up against gravity. Right. When you're lowering down toward the floor you got to put the brakes on. It's gravity your assisted. Shoulders. Okay. You're gravity assisted. So you need to modulate the force of gravity. Right. Got it. Okay. And when you're in the new, you're just in the push up position, you're holding the line. That's so clear. Okay. What is the second term we all need to understand? Okay. So the second one I would say is, uh, Normal curves of the vertebral column. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the, the vertebral column is not a straight line. Mm -hmm. We have four curves. In the spine. In the spine. If we think about the convexity of the, sacro, the sacrum. The concavity, the lordosis of the lumbar, the convexity, the kyphosis of the thoracic, and then the lordosis of the cervical. Right. The reason why we have normal curves, and these are normal. Mm -hmm. A straight spine is not a normal spine. Right. Okay, a, a, a curved spine is. Uh, the reason why we have normal curves of the spine is because your vertebral column is like a coiled spring and it's designed to absorb shock to maintain balance yeah and to distribute load mm -hmm. so the normal curves create a resilient column of energy that reduces strain on the body. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's really, that's a great image. Yay. <laughs> uh, and it, the normal curves are particularly important when we talk about load sharing, mm -hmm. especially for the low back, mm -hmm. because a lot of folks have been socialized to tuck the tailbone. Yeah, it's a disease. Because that strengthens the abdominals, and that's not what happens. Your back is at its strongest when you're displaying your normal curves. Mm -hmm. It's also at its longest. Uh-huh. Okay, so, so nor normal curves are a kind of ter a fundamental terminology, but also conceptually something that, as a practitioner or a teacher of yoga, we need to be looking out for. That we're yes. not we're not asking our students, for example, to create abnormal curves. Yes. We want to really understand that there are no straight lines in the body. Yeah. I mean, even if we look at the femur, at the thigh bone, perhaps you have an idea that the thigh bone goes straight down yeah. onto the shin bone. It doesn't. It cur. It's... <laughs> It curves forward. 
Yes, it has a lordosis. Uh huh. Yeah. Mary know. Richards just blowing minds everywhere. <laughs> so you're you're saying if you look at me from the side, if I'm standing and I'm turned this way, mm -hmm. my femur is going to come forward. Yes. Wow. Wow. Yes. Okay. What is the third terminology? Third piece of terminology. Yeah, I know it's only a preview because you would love to give us ten terms. <laughs> I know. The concave convex law. Okay. So talk to us a little bit about that. Okay. So the the law of concave convex motion basically states that optimal and maximal movement mm -hmm. is achieved when we move the concavity mm -hmm. over and around the convexity. Okay, so use, can you use, I like that, can you use other terms, like I know concave and convex are confusing to people sometimes. Mm -hmm. So if we think, for instance, about the knee mm -hmm. in Virasana, mm -hmm. the depression, the concavity, mm -hmm. the cave of the knee is found on the tibial plateau, mm -hmm. okay, the, the top of your shin bone. Right. And then the ends of your femur mm -hmm. are convex. Okay. So it's much easier for the knee to climb up stairs mm -hmm. than it is to go down stairs. Okay. Because when you're going up, mm -hmm. when you're going up, the concavity is optimally positioned for the femur to roll and glide on it. But when you're going down, the convexity of the femur is pushing against the concavity, creating resistance. Okay, so I'm not sure I totally get this. So Okay, so if we think about the hip, let's think about the ball and socket hip. Okay, so you're saying, let me just repeat it back. So you're okay. saying the convex concave rule is a sort of anatomic principle that says anywhere in the body in any different joint configuration it's always easiest to move the mortar on the pestle no the 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 concat the, the bowl the bowl around the mortar yes the bowl around the mortar why is that can you help me i because i've heard this before and i always have trouble remembering which so why is it that it's easier to do this than to do this? Gravity. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, in a nutshell. Um, so if we, th okay. Wait, so wait, in wait. The hip, Hold <laughs> on. My, my husband just, hi, Shatsi. Hello. No, come talk. Hi, hey. Nico. Hi. <laughs> nice How to meet you? you. Nice to meet you. Do, um, can we have 15 minutes yeah, of silence? He doesn't know how to be silent. <laughs> you had it right that it's easier to move. It's easier to move the bowl mm -hmm. of the more of the pestle. It's easier to move that than it is to move the mortar. Yeah, and you said that has to do with gravity, but that doesn't really make sense to me because all the different joints are in different relationships to grab, you know, if you go upside so I don't they know. are, they are. But see, when we're using uh, the concave convex law in particular, when we consider gravity, we want to reduce wear and tear on the joints. Right. And so one of the reasons why shoulders mm -hmm. are so vulnerable to injury and wear and tear is that we're always moving the rounded head of the arm bone mm -hmm. against the shoulder socket. Uh -huh. There's more friction. Mm -hmm. So if we want to reduce friction, mm -hmm. if we want to optimize free joint movement, right. we want to we want to get off mm -hmm. of the concavity mm -hmm. of, of, the, of the of the convexity, and so that means we shelter it in the cave. Mm -hmm. So you know how it's much easier to do uttanasana, standing forward fold, to stretch the hamstrings versus. Uh, laying on the mat and bringing and you know doing supta pound and gustasana hand yeah. to foot pose. Mm -hmm. The reason why that's easier is in uttanasana in the standing forward fold. You're moving the concavity of the hip joints over and around the heads of the thigh bones. Mm -hmm. But when you when you're 
lying down on the back body and you bring the leg up toward the head, well, you're moving the head, the head of the femur against the joint. Okay. So you're creating, I mean, it is, I, first, I keep thinking of the mortar and pestle. It's like you're in Supta Padangasasana, you're, you're moving the mortar against, you're creating friction. But in Uttanasana, standing forward fold, you're moving the bowl around the, the mortar. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, in conclusion, tell us, like, we need to understand this because. Give us the kind of tagline. If you were filming an infomercial for understanding the convex concave law, like, wh what does this understanding help us? The more we integrate this learning, what does it help us to do as yoga teachers and practitioners? It helps us reduce joint loading. Okay. It helps us protect our joints. Okay. It reduces wear and tear. And this is particularly important uh, considering osteoarthritis mm -hmm. is one of the most prevalent rheumatic diseases in the Western world. Right. Wear and tear is a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we want to reduce wear and tear, especially because many of our actions of daily living don't do that. So uh, is osteoarthritis actually like preventable is it about our behavior i thought it was it had a big genetic component there's a genetic component for sure but what we can do is we can reduce we can slow progression okay and we can re and we can perhaps delay onset okay very clear Mary, tell, so, us, tell us where we can find you online. You can find me on Facebook at A Little Yoga Goes a Long Way. And my website, maryrichardsyoga.com. And I'm lizzielasseter.com or at lizzielasseter on Facebook. If you liked this conversation, if you want to stay in the loop about our upcoming digital anatomy training, please visit experientialanatomy.yoga. And when you give us your email there, you're also going to get the kind of catalog of all of the other Today's Anatomy questions that we filmed in the past. They're going to come automatically every couple of days into your inbox. So you can learn anatomy on a drip. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right, Mary. Namaste. Thank you so much for sharing with us. All of your My pleasure. all of your enthusiasm and your knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoy this so much and I really appreciate the opportunity. I dream about anatomy and yoga, so let's do the Hillary Wiggle. That's right. That's right. I'm wearing purple today. I'm ready to go. <laughs>